UAPs, Unidentified Anomalous Phenomena. Are they extraterrestrial, interdimensional, time travelers in origin, or are they simply a result of top secret military black projects, false flag alien invasion psyop, drones, or other human made aircraft? Join UFO historian Don Ecker, MUFON State Director for New York Chris DiPerno, retired veteran pilot Commander Cobra, and well-esteemed host and researcher Martin Willis as they discuss the latest news and topics regarding UAPs with a no-holds-barred approach on UAP Crossfire. Well, good evening, greatest audience on the planet. As always, it's a privilege to uh, join these fine hosts that I do this show with as well as the great audience out there spread across the globe that checks into this show, UAP Crossfire. And once again, uh, a very special um, note that we are in Holy Week uh, for those that are Christians that are following it for the Easter holiday that comes this weekend. Uh, Holy Thursday tonight, it is uh, the third week of Ramadan, which is just about the end for the uh, followers of Islam. So it's a, a rather uh, poignant time to bring the subject up of UFOs and the Bible. Now, how this show came about is uh, we are very happy to see Mr. Don Ecker, Decker to uh, most of us, who has uh, recovered sufficiently to join us tonight and is in good vim and vigor. If the pre-show was a show, it would sell great tickets as he uh, tried to give me an atomic wedgie before we got on the show in a virtual sense. Obviously, we're not in the same room for that to happen. I, I think I may have actually embarrassed Chris just a ton of bit when I brought up the atomic wedgie. I mean, he was oh. he had to think about that. And Martin. Yeah, did, I got a thing going on. <laughs> and I got, uh, we're glad to see Martin, who is uh, from his Southern Command Post in uh, the great state of South Carolina. Chris, who's bringing it in from the, uh, the very balmy and beautiful upstate New York, which is just lovely. This time uh, it's here. sunny and cold today. Sunny and cold. But we're uh, fortunate to all be together tonight, and I'm very thankful for that. Uh, I will put out, uh, we have a very special guest that Martin was able to bring in on this subject. that will be joining us at the top of the hour, um, and we're excited to have him on, and we'll have a good intro when he comes on. And before I forget, I always want to throw this in, because I it, we jam towards the end of the show so often. And I always try to close my shows, especially the ones that I host here and, and my own shows. Uh, God's beast that surpasses all knowledge and understanding. And I bring that up early because what we talk about to some um, to some Christians, to to many faiths, it can be very disconcerting. Uh, does the Bible reference uh, extraterrestrial activity? Um, and I'm what led me to this is that while we were coming up with the show, and we had a lot. This was a definitely a herding the cats kind of week, trying to get all of us together. It was a it was a, our challenge as we were coming down on a number of things. Um, this has been one of the areas where I have been probably most at peace from the time of being a very young uh, man, grow, growing up Roman Catholic at the time. And I grew up in a household that uh, extraterrestrials, UFOs, anybody who knows me for a long period of time knows that I, uh, I always honor my dad on this because my dad was just very taken with the subject in the 60s. So I grew up in a house with, uh, Don's Magazine, um, I'm sure countless paperbacks that were the, uh, the, the, the story of the day. And then a book came out by Eric Von Donegan, Chariots of the Gods, which was followed up by a movie. There was a couple other parts in that. And he brought up countless uh, pieces of what he considered were evidence to prove that this, that we had this existence or we had this exchange going back to ancient times, and it was recorded in holy scriptures of various faiths. Um, so that's what got us kind of started on this show. There's a picture that uh, Skywatcher has, if he has a chance, he can throw it up. It's one of the more famous pictures, and I think it's very poignant. On the top part, you see the depiction of the crucifixion, which will be uh, remembered tomorrow on Holy uh, Good Friday. And on the upper left and right-hand corners, you see the two insert pictures on the bottom. 
Um, this is in a, it's a wall mural in a cathedral in France. And it, when I saw this and later on became a uh, pilot, if you look at the occupants in those two different vehicles or what appear to be vehicles, their hands are in positions that are very interesting when you consider how we control and manipulate aircraft and flight controls of some kind uh, in their positioning. So that picture, when that was in the book, and then I saw that in a uh, movie theater uh, shortly after the book was out, really caught me uh, and really got me always in the back of my mind. I have found it completely compatible to believe that extraterrestrials um, are part of God's plan, part of the, the universe that is created by this, this entity, God. And I didn't find it as a as a as a competing thing. I've always I've used the same kind of thought process when we talk about uh, spiritual activities because of angels, demons that are mentioned that are driven out, angels that have visited. Uh, I, I find it all compatible uh, with it. I will put a number of questions out through the course of our uh, discussion tonight, but I'm going to turn this over to my guest hosts. Uh, in a second. There's two people I do want to recognize. One is Reverend Michael J. S. Carter. If you had followed my earlier show, he was one of my guests. He has written a very interesting book about uh, extraterrestrials. He a, lives a, a very, he shared his experiences of what he b believes has occurred to him. And uh, he's a friend of, uh, well, of, of Skywatchers. And he was a lovely guest and I really formed a very nice friendship with him. And another one that was interesting, I'm going to show the book in a second here is Reverend Dan uh, and Reverend Dan Carlson. This is his book. Re oh, the way I found him is he is one of the, uh, the in the last uh, two, three weeks contacted me on the email after one of the shows. And he, uh, he started a conversation with me with a couple other people about some of the things that we talked about and he and I picked up a pretty lengthy conversation. And I always tell that to the audience who are key tonight. If you are uh, interested or you have a comment, happy, uh, sad, good, bad, please feel free. Commander Cobra, KGRADB at Gmail. And you can get a hold of me. And I will be looking. Um, I will be looking at uh, the chat tonight from our audience for inputs and questions. I am, unfortunately, I'm not able to interact directly, but please go on. So I will start out with Chris. Chris, what are your thoughts about extraterrestrials recorded in the, uh, in the good book and other holy torts? Well, I, I actually think that there's some evidence in the good book that shows that extraterrestrials are in it. Now, the big question, is, as you said, can extraterrestrials be demons? Are they demons cloaking themselves in everything? Because we know in the book that says Satan is the great hoaxer. He's he can manipulate things. He can um, bring things to into this world that makes us believe certain things. Now, I will tell you from my own experiences, I believe in good and evil and I believe angels and demons. And as a police officer, I think I've seen enough evil to make me convinced that there's absolute uh, demons that that are on this earth that do evil. Now, how do you say that? Well, I will tell you that I, I think I met a demon. I, I mean, a man who did right. such a heinous crime. But when I was interviewing him, and this is the first time I'm going to say this on, on air. When I interviewed him and he finally confessed to it, his eyes changed. And I mean, I, I, I wasn't far away. I was almost nose to nose to him. And he looked right into my eyes and smiled. And uh, w they found me uh, dry heaving in the, uh, in the bathroom. Because, I, I mean, I guess you had to be there to actually see it. But I saw it and that convinced me that there's evil in this world, demons in this world, and there's good in this world. But I think 
I think as we we look forth as the ET, can it be something that the good book has has told us to either be aware of or cautious of, or be able to look at this with open eyes as and not run you know run right in and say yes this and yes that. Um, you know I'm a I'm, I'm a spiritual guy. So I, I kind of take things at, at face value as sometimes, but I also keep an open mind to it. But I will say that um, I, th I think there's enough evidence in the book to allow us to open that thought. And one other thing I want to say, and I'll probably mention this later in the show, you know, a lot of abductees have used the word Jesus as they're being abducted and the abduction stops. It disappears. And uh, Joe Jordan, who I've spoken to down in Florida, who's done probably hundreds of abduction cases, and myself, I've done a tremendous amount of abduction cases. Kathleen Martin has also taught me the same thing, says that as some cases where they invoke the word Jesus or God, the abductions abruptly stop. It's interesting. One thing I will say, Chris, that you have brought this, uh, that experience you had up, and it matches very close to something that Paul Eno talked about in the many exorcisms that he assisted in when he was a seminarian. Um, that uh, that connection and something that he that he was told that he had to prepare himself to be a uh, guard against. That, that kind of connection that occurs, you know, that you that you, you have that uh, uh, that linking up with this this evil. And, well, go and ahead. I agree with you, Commander. I, I, I think there I wasn't prepared for. It. Sure. And and I, I think it's something that we all start should start looking at. Another another situation that it reminds me of. Uh, I, I won't mention his name because I haven't spoke to him in a bit. He wrote a number of books on the um, uh, the possessed doll that's down in Key West. Oh yes, I, and, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, and and uh, Robert the doll. Yeah, and he was on one of the every year they take it out of the case and they do like an inventory inspection on it, and he talks about dealing with this moment where he knows that the face of this all transformed um and he experienced this and he uh he used to do a lot of haunted tours and he would prepare himself going in and out and on one he didn't and he felt that he was plagued for quite a while um very very nice guy very interesting uh, uh series of books that he's written and uh again when i hear the way you describe it is the way they have described it to me that what they had in that experience uh, and i think is there a lot of similarities uh, it is they, 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 and i i think that that just kind of ties to a lot now uh don um i think you have a very uh you shared it before and we've heard uh, you talk before on this the book of enoch has a lot of uh, interesting passages that i think line up um, when you look into the Bible, the uh, Nerephim, Seraphim, the, uh, the, the offspring that is uh, talked about between angels or celestial uh, beings and uh, uh, women on earth, there's a lot there. Um, I think it's recorded in the Bible pretty clearly that we know that there were people that were giants. Um, David slew one, which is a very famous Bible story. So... Pick it up and, and, and help the audience know where you're coming out on this, because I think you have a very unique perspective. Okay, but before I do, uh, there's something else I feel compelled to mention. Uh, <clears throat> this was on Easter week. Right. 52 years ago in the former Republic of Vietnam. I was a member of a nine-man team situated up on the demilitarized zone in a camp called A4 or Alpha 4. We were conducting intelligence operations up there. And on the 30th of March, the North Vietnamese communists launched what today is known as the Easter Offensive. Right. And subsequently, our camp was overrun. 
Now, <clears throat> there's too much there to even try to articulate about because unless you were there, uh, you, you wouldn't understand the complete chaos, terror, and so forth. But the team, although we did have a couple of guys that got hurt, not fatally, thank God, but a couple of guys did get banged up. We were able to exfiltrate out of the camp. We had called in for an emergency evacuation, and subsequently we were picked up by some UE helicopters. All well and good. We were taken to our parent unit in Fubai the next day like a complete, total dumbass. I volunteered to go up to our facility that we had in Kwong Tree, which was below the DMZ, but above our parent unit in Fubai. And I had to take some explosives up there because we were afraid, or the military, our command authority was afraid that this place was gonna get hit next, which it did. Now, we had top secret equipment up there, crypto gear. And this stuff, it just, couldn't be allowed to fall into enemy hands. So these explosives I took up was to uh, destroy that equipment and then see what happens. We probably were going to be pulled out of there. However, uh, while up there, I was promoted to the non-commissioned officer in charge of our reactionary platoon. We were expecting to, uh, to get hit, to get probed. And the, uh, the situation was really, really dire. So the night, April Fool's Day, as a matter of fact, I spent the entire night out on the perimeter. I had a uh, South Vietnamese, we called them rough puffs. They were like uh, National Guard, okay, or militia. This kid, and he was a young kid, had an M1 carbine from World War II, and he had a M8 Willie Pete grenade. I'll never forget this, strapped to his, uh, to his uh, web belt. And we spent the whole night. Now, he could barely speak any English. I spoke TT Vietnamese, very little Vietnamese, but some. And uh, we spent the whole night out there patrolling around. We had some things happen, but that's not for here. So that morning, about 4.30, I went back to our command bunker and uh, scrounged up a ration. I hadn't eaten in a day or two. Had that ration, laid down for about an hour, and then got up. Now, this entire time, we were being shelled. I guess it was maybe 8.30, and I was still in the bunker, and I heard a couple of booms and bangs. Now, these weren't incoming. These were, it sounded like grenades, enemy grenades. And I grabbed my weapon. I had a, a an old M3 A1 grease gun, a 45 caliber submachine gun. I grabbed that thing and went charging outside. And just as I got out in front of the bunker, honest to God, I heard one coming in. And it sounded like a freight train. And anybody that's ever been under fire will know what I'm talking about. And this thing slammed, I don't know, maybe 30, 40 feet behind me. And then suddenly, as this thing is going off, I felt like somebody slamming in the chest with a ball bat. Well, next thing I knew, I'm laying face down in the dirt, and I am hurting like Huh, you wouldn't believe. Now, I looked up. Now, remember, this is Easter Sunday, April the 2nd, 1972. I looked up, and I saw the guy that shot me. He was a Vietnamese, crawl and he had a buddy with him, crawling through the razor wire. And the rifle he had was an SKS carbine. Now... If you don't know what that is, it's a semi-automatic rifle that the Soviets, basically the Russians, developed right around the end of World War II. They had uh, discovered the German Sturmgewehr 44, 
which was a brand new rifle, the world's first assault rifle the Germans had made. And they basically copied the ammunition. Then they made the gun to fit it in. And this ammunition was called an intermediate round. Okay, they took a full-blown rifle cartridge and in essence cut it in half, made a, uh, a, a brand new cartridge with less powder, although the same bullet, okay, and uh, hey, it worked great. Well, he, he had shot me with one of these. And I'm laying there and on the end of his rifle was this huge bayonet, a triangular permanently attached under the barrel bayonet. And the only thing in my mind I could think of is, my God, that guy's going to come in and stick it in me. Okay, he's going to finish the job. And stuff is going off everywhere. Well, I did have a pistol. I had a 45. And my left arm wasn't working, but the 45 was on my right. And I pulled that out. And I emptied the magazine of both these guys. They both dropped. Now, did I get them? I probably did. And I wasn't going to go check, even if I could have been able to. But they didn't get back up. And somebody in the bunker heard the shooting. As a matter of fact, it was uh, the first sergeant. Now that I think about it, he ran out, grabbed me, and drug me back inside. And they called for a medevac. They got a medic in there. He started applying first aid. Long story short, they put me on a chopper. They flew me out to Fubai. And the wounds were too bad, so they had to fly me to Da Nang. And there was a big army hospital there. Now, the purpose of all this, you're going to hear in a second. I get to Da Nang, okay, they wheel me right into surgery. And the first thing they do, they know they take a look, they know they got to operate. So they apply anesthesia, which killed me, actually killed me. The anesthesia reacted with the food I had eaten that morning, early in the morning. And if you've ever been in elective surgery or anything, you know they'll tell you, don't eat anything 18 to 24 hours before you come in to be operated on because of the anesthesia. Well, I started vomiting. I'm under, okay? I was out like a light, but I started vomiting so violently that I literally woke up in my mind, gagging, I was choking to death, and that stopped my heart. Now, this is the part that's going to sound unbelievable. The next thing I knew, I'm floating up in the air, maybe 10 or 15 feet, I'm looking down, and I see them working on somebody. I didn't know who it was at first. To be honest, I didn't care. I had never been so peaceful or at peace my entire existence. Well, suddenly I felt something grab me and push me back. I swear to God, this is the truth. This is what I remember. And this deep baritone voice said, your work here is not yet complete. Boom. Next thing I knew, I'm coming awake in the intensive care facility there. This nurse came in, and she walked up to the bed. I didn't know her from Adam. And she said, Don, she said, I've been looking for you for a long time. I'm not going to say her last name, but her first name was Mary. And I had no clue what this woman was talking about. And I said, what do you mean? She said, well you're from my hometown or i'm from your hometown she had checked all the casualties every day to see if anybody came from that part of pennsylvania and i was it the first one she ever ran into so then she told me she said you know we lost you we lost you for almost two minutes before we could bring you back and you know I'm groggy, I'm half out of it, and I swear to God, I didn't remember any of that then for about three or four years. It was three or four years later when this came back to me. Jeez. So, <clears throat> Easter, 
I died and I resurrected. <laughs> and every year at this time, okay, every year at this time of the year, I go through about three weeks of really deep, dark depression. And it started about 25 years ago. And I'm thankful that this is soon going to be over. I want to get the hell out of that. Now, to get back to the Bible. Okay. In October of 1989, I made my first appearance on Larry King Live. And that night, Larry King was not there. He was on his probably fourth wedding and honeymoon, okay? This guy would get married and divorced and married and divorced like I changed my tennis shoes, all right? So they had Pat Buchanan, who incidentally in 1992 ran trying to get the presidential nomination from the Republican Party, but he was the guy hosting the show. And during that show, I mentioned toward the end, and the show was about a UFO landing in the still Soviet Union city of Voronezh. All right. Bill, if you'd flash the cover of the book, please. I mentioned having picked up and read a book by a guy by the name of Zachariah Sitchin called The Twelfth Planet. And let me tell you what, two things changed my life in the last 50 years. Number one was reading that book. And number two was buying my first computer. All right. Now, after that, after that show, about a week later, I get a letter at UFO magazine from Sitchin. And he was thanking me. And he said, I really appreciate you having met, uh, mentioned my book. He said, uh, that was very gracious of you and blah, 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 right? Well, I found out he was coming out to the coast on one of his speaking events. We made arrangements to meet. Later, in 1995, at my spy fest in Orlando, Florida, an intelligence operation, we'll have to talk about that sometime, Okay, where we were being surveilled. It, it's such an incredible story. You'll think think I'm nuts, but uh, well, you've but shared part of that. You've shared part of that with us in the past. Yeah, yeah. Well, but, you know, like 18 of you in a gigantic auditorium. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that that was a hell of a story. But anyway, Sitchin became a very dear friend, and Bill, pop up the picture of Zachariah and I, please. Yeah. There he is. Now that man. I, I, we just want for the understand the audience to understand that is you uh, with the dark tie. Yeah, and the mustache. And the mustache. Oh, 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 wait, he had a mustache too. I've dark got the tie. dark mustache. Dark mustache <laughs> and dark tie. Yeah. So anyway, Sitchin was an amazing man. He was Jewish that had been born in the Ukraine. Somehow, his family were able to get out of Russia, okay? Uh, they, I don't know if they escaped or how they pulled it off, but they got out. Ended up going to the UK, to the United Kingdom, where Sitchin ended up going to the London School of Economics. Now, one day, <clears throat> when he was out here on the coast, we were having lunch. And I asked him very pointedly, I said, Zechariah, I said, how did you become involved in this business with the, with the Anunnaki, the Sumerians, the, uh, the cities uh, of Sumeria, the ancient cities, the first ones that we knew of, okay? And at that period of time, academia still was proclaiming that Sumeria was the world's first civilization, going back 6,000 years. Now, that never made sense to me, even when I was in college, quite frankly, because, number one, there were other places around that we knew about. The city of Jericho, which even academia said went back at that time 9,000 years. 
So well, wait a minute. You got Samaria here, 6,000 years old. You got this other city over here, Jericho, that they think is 9,000. How, do, how does that compute? Well, it didn't compute to me. But at any rate, this is what they were teaching long before Gobekli Tepe or these other astounding finds that, uh, that we've since made. Right. So he told me he was in a religious class, and he didn't say it exactly, but I'm sure he was preparing for his bar mitzvah or something, was being instructed by a rabbi, and uh, got into the argument with the rabbi about, of all things, what we, if we're Christian, know to be Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. And in that, if you read it, <clears throat> excuse me, in your Bible, you will see that the sons of God, okay, look down upon basically the land of man, observed the women, and they became very aroused. They found the earth women very attractive. And one of them said, hey, let's go down there and take as many of these gals as we can grab, okay? And subsequently, after having sexual relations with them, they had progeny born, all right? And these became the men of great renown, known as the Nephilim, all right? Now... That's a pretty explosive passage in the Bible, but only one of many. Now, what does that mean? Well, it basically means that apparently extraterrestrials had come to the Earth, okay, and they must have been physiologically very similar to us, and they found that they were compatible with human females. Now... That's just one little part of it. But Sitchin took it back much further. He was an ancient language linguist. And this man traveled literally all around the globe to these ancient sites discovering, well, what could only be a forgotten history, okay, of when, what went on many, many millennia ago. Now, according to the records that Sitchin read, he found out that these ETs, apparently they must have been, were called by at least the Sumerians the Anunnaki, which means those who from heaven to earth came. In other words, they came down out of the sky. And... The ancients worshipped these beings as gods. Now, the chief god among them was a guy by the name of Anu, or An. Now, this in itself is very interesting. If you know anything about ancient Egypt, okay, there was a pharaoh that originally, after his father died, took over the reins of kingship in Egypt by the name of Amenhotep IV. But this guy had a different idea. And how he came across this idea, God only knows, no pun intended. But he changed his name to Ankenaten, okay? And which meant a believer or a worshiper of the god Atun, all right, the solar disk. He completely turned Egyptian society literally upside down, inside out. They moved the capital to an area now known as Armana. They built the city from the dust and the dirt. As a matter of fact, I recently read a very unusual uh, historical fact about that, that while this area is still undergoing archaeological expeditions, many, many, many graves 
were discovered of very young people that had died as a result of not only malnutrition, but many bodily bone breaks and, and stuff. In other words, he basically worked these people to death to make his capital city. Now, he didn't quite make 20 years, all right? He was also the guy married to that legendary beauty, Nefertiri, all right? Uh, and King Tukanamun was his son to one of his wives. Now, in those days, okay, the royalty married within their own families in the mistaken belief they could keep their blood pure, not realizing the type of damage they were doing to the offspring. I mean, having sexual relations with your sister or your mother or a close family relative, it basically destroyed the family line ultimately. But two can come, King Tut, all right, later he, he his, his father, mysteriously died, there was an interim pharaoh, and then Tut came along, and he only lived until he was about 19, and there's a lot of, a lot of mystery about what happened after that. But these people were all originally worshiping many gods, then the one god, and then after Tut came to power, he was basically forced to reinstate the old religions. Now, let's talk about some of those. Gods, okay. Anu, An, had two chief sons. They were named Enlil and Enki. And these gods were sent down to earth. Enlil had the overall control of the whole planet. Enki was given another area. Now, there was a lot of contention, um, according to the records of these gods. And they were here to basically rape the planet of its mineral and other resources. Now, that sounds pretty heady. What do you mean, rape the planet? Well, they were primarily looking for gold. Now, what in the hell would they want gold for? Okay, granted, it's good in electronics and that type of thing. But according to the records Sitchin translated, they had a process, <coughs> excuse me, that their planet, Nibiru, the reason they left Nibiru to come to Earth was because its atmosphere was basically disintegrating. It sounds to me like they were losing their ozone layer. Perhaps the rays from the sun, okay, were creating problems for them. They intended to sprinkle this gold into their atmosphere through some process to help shield the planet. Now, this planet, Nibiru, according to Sitchin, had a very vast, long-range orbit around our sun. 3,600 years to make one revolution. And according to the old records, these gods were here for practically forever, arriving 420,000 years ago, give or take. And now we're in the uh, uh, anywhere from 2000 BC up to about 1000 BC. And these guys were still in evidence. Now, they brought with them workers from their planet called the Ajiji. And after backbreaking toil and labor, the Ajiji revolted and claimed that they just couldn't do it anymore, were not working like that. Well, the gods, air quote, the gods decided we are going to create workers. 
And according to the records, they took early proto-humans, genetically tinkered with them, okay, and Homo sapien sapien was the end result. Now, when you hear stuff like this, okay, there's no way I could prove any of this except for what were in the records. You've got to keep an open mind, all right? A lot of people will get very, very distressed and even angry hearing this because it's impacting their long-held beliefs that they learned in church. I'll give you an example. Uh, before I met my wife, okay, I had been dating a girl uh, that came, this was after my, my son died, and I ultimately got, ended up getting divorced. I was dating a girl who had originally come from Canada, and her mother had come down to visit. Now, they were staunch Roman Catholics. And one day, we were sitting in my townhouse, we were having a cup of coffee, and uh, we were talking about religion, which is always a bad idea, all right? And she had said something detrimental about Jewish people. And I said, hey, look, I said, how can you even say that? Jesus, the Messiah, was a Jew. And I'll never forget the look and God's truth of horror <laughs> that washed over her face. And she said vehemently, no, he wasn't. He was Roman Catholic. <laughs> I gotta tell you, you know, a true believer, right? Roman Catholic. The woman didn't even realize what in the hell she said, all right? But she just couldn't accept that Jesus Christ was a Jew. Now, incidentally, if you trace the Jewish people, the Hebrews, back in time, they originally emanated from Sumeria, okay? Abraham, all right, the father of all the Israeli peoples, originally came from the city of Ur on the Chaldees, all right? They were then called the Haparu, the Haparu, all right? Or those people who wandered. And, uh, of course, Abraham and his family and flocks and what have you ended up doing that very thing, wandering, all right? But uh, there's so much about history that we don't know. Now, human beings being created to be what? Originally, slave labor. And these various uh, secondary and even third gods that came down to earth began their own cults, all right? And like I said, <clears throat> the Anunnaki did not get along with each other. There was a lot of warfare among them. And how did they conduct that warfare? By their human devotees, all right? They arranged them into various armies. As a matter of fact, about, I think it was and I'd have to go back and check my, my files, around 2500 B.C. And it was Sitchin that originally turned me on to this fact. There is clear evidence that at one point in the Middle East, okay, it might have been somewhere between what today is Syria and Iraq today, all right, there is a, a spot where a nuclear device was detonated. And this wasn't the only one, all right? There's also a spot in India, if you know anything about the Indian Vedic records, all right? There was a, apparently an atomic device that was detonated up there. So these bastards, Anunnaki, brought their, their, their uh, well, their religion, I guess you could say, their, uh, their angry, uh, spiteful relations with each other. They brought it down here to earth. Now, do you know anything about the human history, human 
Homo sapiens sapien. We've been a warring race forever, okay? Uh, right now, today, we've got wars going on in a number of spots around the globe. Uh, when the news reports it, like, for example, in Yemen, the Houthis, okay, an Islamic terrorist group, are trying to sink vessels in the Red Sea, and uh, they're attacking shipping out there. Uh, <clears throat> things like this, the Ukraine, another place that's being decimated by the warfare between the Ukrainians and the Russians. It, it's horrible. And I kind of think that it's a result going back many, many, many thousands of years. Now, somebody's going to say, Ecker, how do you know, or why, what makes you think that they were here looking for gold? Well, do you know that in South Africa, an ancient, ancient mine dated back over 300,000 years ago, okay, something or someone was mining gold there. Now, what good was gold to primitive people? They couldn't make tools from it. It's too soft. They couldn't make uh, weapons from it. It's too soft. What did they do with it? Well, they made jewelry and things like that. But, uh, but as far as, as a, a useful metal, it wasn't. And if it wasn't, then who the hell would have been mining it over 300,000 years ago? Okay, which to me tells me that uh, somebody sure did, and they must have had a good reason to do it. Now, we as human beings today, hey, what a contentious bunch of assholes we are, all right? Just take a look around today in the United States. It used to be that people with two, two different ideas may have disagreed with each other, but they could have sat down and discussed it. Well, that ship has sailed. All right, Don, I got to yes. grab it from you because I want to get Martin in on this. Now, sure. Martin. Martin who? Oh, Martin. Oh. Martin, you got two minutes. Yeah, I know. Well, um, our guest has been in here the whole entire time. Oh no, no, time. no, no! The, the guest yeah, is I know, coming in but I'm just, I'm want, just letting you know. I yeah. want I, I completely because uh, no one was guest. looking at my private chat, so nope, I just nope. thought I, I already throw talked that to our there. guest. Mark, yeah. question: You come from a fairly agnostic kind of view to all this stuff that we've been talking about, and I want to get back to UFOs in the Bible. Don, as I've heard, and Don's explained. Uh, this history. What do you see when you, you when you hear these discussions and these and these different things go on? And uh, for in the chat, I think it's B Baker. I, I apologize. I'm jumping back and forth between the two. Um, I did hear the interpretation of that first picture that I put up of the angel, the sun, and the moon uh, in that depiction in the in the church. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. If that's the reasoning behind it, I find it absolutely intriguing, though, when I look at that picture. And that's what was the opening of the show. So, Martin, what do you think when you look at all this? Well, first of all, I want to say eventually when it downloads, I have a video I'm going to pull up that I made on just, you know, these Renaissance paintings that have what looks like a UFO. And you're right there. There are people that have uh, that study that you know, those type of paintings right. and think that there's, you know, suns and moons and things like that, other things depicted. Right. But anyway, uh, well, first of all, Don's gone right now, but I, I, you know, part of his story was, he's I'm here. Here. here, I'm here. right here. Don, that, that really, uh, about your, you know, your, uh, what do they call, uh, near death, near death, N D E N D E experience. Boy, that is really something. And I'd love to talk to you more about that sometime in the future and sorry to hear when you said about your son that's i can't even imagine but um when it comes to you know zachariah stitching i've never really looked into that type of thing um you know i had i guess i 
I assumed that a lot of it was just kind of out there, to be honest with you. So uh, about the Anunnaki and the Nibiru and all that, uh, it just seems like where is he getting the information from? I've always thought that type of thing. I do believe there, you know, we were hunters and gatherers for a while, and then we started settling into these little societies. And you're probably right, Don, it probably does go way back more than the 6,500 years that they talk about. But I don't know exactly when there became societies enough to work together to survive that type of thing. Uh, well, I think don't was, forget the Great Flood, <laughs> roughly 11,600 years ago, that basically practically covered the whole world. We lost millions and millions of miles of land as a result of the waters. And we know that it, it happened. Something happened terribly. But I personally believe, and we've touched on it a couple of, and I'm going to shut up here, but we touched on it a couple of times. I firmly believe that there was advanced, and I'm not saying how advanced, but advanced civilizations that were destroyed before. I believe that's very much a possibility too. Um, because there's a lot of empty time out there where things could have happened. You know, we're talking, you know, the Earth is, you know, what is it, 4.8 billion? I can't even remember. 4.5. But, but anyway, we have all this time where things could have happened. And then we had, you know, ice ages. We had all kinds of things that could have been, you know, uh, uh, a volcanism of the whole entire planet for some reason or another at some point that wiped out any evidence of earlier uh, you know, civilizations is very possible. There could have been other intelligent civilizations here. I do agree with that. As far as, um, you know, the Bible, I got to say, I don't know m enough about the Bible. I know Ezekiel. I've heard uh, of the accounts of Ezekiel and things like that, but I've never really looked into any part of the Bible when it comes to UFOs. But our guest, as we'll, we'll bring up a, a later, he's waiting in the back. He, uh, We'll be able to talk on that topic a lot. Uh, so, you know, I'm looking forward to hearing so that. Your your take, um, the Bible as a historical reference, you talk about Ezekiel, I think that's probably one of the great uh, spots to look when you're looking for that. Um, I, I, I would even say that if you look at other books that are not in the King James Bible that you find in uh, Catholic and others, if you look at um, Gnostic uh, writings, all of them along that, even the Tamad, um, there is a lot there. I mean, what Don was talking about uh, with Mr. Kitchen's uh, rabbinical uh, encounter, uh, what he read, uh, those things are there. So do you, do you see it as a possible source, yay or nay? Uh, you know, it's a, I think it's a possible source, but, you know, I mean, the Bible was written by people right. and there was a lot of, you know, I mean, and you talk about King James, he came along and changed so many things um, that were in there prior to that. And well, the Old things. Testament, gentlemen, the Old Testament almost entirely emanated from For, Samaria. Right. And, and then Hebrew... Uh, compilation of of the sumerian uh, works yeah yeah so anyway i think it's interesting it's all fascinating to me i was excited to do this show so you hear don't and learn so what i'm getting as you don't dismiss because it is the bible you look at it like you do any other source like you look at artwork whatever to say what is the inspiration of this record that's being yeah. cut well, a lot of things, I think in the past, a lot of things were explained because it was unknown and it was hard. You know, I mean, think what they did when there was an eclipse. You know, they thought the sun god was angry at them and stuff like that. So there was always explanations that we didn't understand that would fit in the use of God in the Bible and not the Bible, but in God or sure. spirits or. Well, you know, I dropped or, a couple of bombshells and I, I'm shocked that none of you guys picked up on it. And that is. The fact that at some point in Earth's past, we were nuked. I heard you say it, but I mean, how, how do you know that? I mean, that was like the gentleman that was on this show saying that Mars was nuked. You know, I mean, how, where is, you know, there are things that could well, that, explain that it. That gentleman, or, Martin, is one of the premier Mars scientists around, John Brandenburg. And he proved it through Xenon 129. Okay, which can only come from two places, 
Well, number I have one, a supernova. Mark. Number two, a hydrogen warhead. I talked with uh, Mark D'Antonio about that. He knows all about him and, and that theory and everything. And he believes there's could be other answers for that. You know, I mean, what I understand they? he's written. What are they? What well, are he they? did tell me, but I can't remember them. You know, oh, well, we're not going off topic. No, no, we're not going. We're sticking with the, the show because you guys put me through a lot to get everybody together. And I want Chris, Chris, the, you're going to walk us out the last two minutes. What do what? you take? What? I'm what? What's your, what? Give me your take on the Bible as a record of extraterrestrial encounters. Ah, we're all going to hell. How's that? <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> well, I guess that's done. I Thanks, everybody, for showing up. I hope you stick around for the my, second my hour. My buddy Martin says, screw all that. There's no such thing. I mean, uh, no, come on. I'm, I'm just joking. But when you talk about the Bible and UFOs, the, the Bible mentions stuff that we could take as ufos or spiritual or whatever there is some correlation to that now do i mean there's there's astrophysicists out there there's pentagon people who believe that there's no such thing as aliens i'm not sure that's true in my own belief i kind of believe that if if god would make other races somewhere i, I mean he can say you know, I really screwed up on these humans. Boy, look at them. All right, let me try it over on this planet over here. And let me try it on that planet over there. And, you know, it, it could be the reverse. Maybe he thought those guys were all screwed up and he made us. You know, I don't know. I mean, the, the whole thing is a mystery. Nobody is an expert at this. Nobody is. But I will say that I think there's a lot of stuff that you could take from the Bible and say, wow, you can apply it to certain you know, extraterrestrial theories and then take some of what I, I got to tell you, why do abductionists? And I, and I said this in the beginning, why do abductionists say if I evoke the name Jesus or God, it stops? Well, I'm going to grab you there because I think our next guest, John Meyer, might have an interesting aspect. And I will just say that if you are a believer in the power of Christ, that would give you the power to get control of that situation. But we're at our break. UAP Crossfire, a uh, a very interesting Holy Week show. And I look forward to seeing you all on the flip side. Please keep your comments coming into the chat room. And I'll try to keep reacting to them. But we have a special guest, John Nyler, excuse me, Myler, who will be joining us on the back side. Martin will be introducing him. Hey members, the new KGRA DB app is now available on iOS and Android devices. Gain on-demand access to any KGRA DB programming. Download any show directly to your mobile device to listen or watch on the go. Go to the App Store and search KGRA DB. listening to the KGRA Digital Broadcasting Network. We provide unparalleled coverage of trending news in the world of ufology, cryptozoology, and paranormal phenomenon. Whether you're watching our video live stream or listening to one of our audio programs, you are getting the best from world-renowned researchers and hosts guiding you through topics the mainstream won't touch. Miss one of your favorite programs? No problem. 
Head over to the members area at KGRADB.com for access to our massive library of award-winning content. Make contact, stay connected, only at KGRADB.com. Welcome back to UAP Crossfire. I am with my co-host, Chris DiPerno Martin and Don Ecker. I am Commander Cobra. It's been an a, a interesting and fun show. And we have a great guest. Martin, please bring our special guest in. And I really appreciate him answering the call uh, very, yeah. very late in the day to jump in with us. Yes, that's right. Uh, John uh, Myler, I believe that's how it's pronounced. I'm not sure he'll correct me on that. Commander Sergeant, retired, California Cyber Operations Chief, retired, 144th Fighter Wing, U.S. Western Air Defense Sector, PG and e Cyber Security Analyst, et cetera, et cetera, author, screenwriter, and he's joining us now. He has written a book uh, basically pertaining to what we are talking about tonight. Welcome to the show, John. Hi, thank you. Yeah, actually, it's uh, four books that uh, cover the christian ufo uh perspective ah okay John, how did you get started in this particular uh area of uh study because i've read uh, some of the things that martin put together and he sent me some information last night i haven't read your books yet but i will though they're, they're going to be on my list how'd you get started okay. uh well i'd always been spiritually inclined uh but uh i will i will go back to an early event that happened when i was five um I was at my great grandmother's house. And so let me explain my great grandmother a little bit. She's from the Bible Belt. Um, and um, this was at a time when uh, I, I would be watched over their house periodically. And then there was a family gathering there on this particular evening uh, back in 1975. And with the whole house full of people, everybody talking and a lot of noise and multiple conversations going on. My grandmother was reading a newspaper article sitting on the couch, my great grandmother. And uh, she said, okay, everybody, listen up. I have an announcement to make to everyone. And everybody's like, okay, well, grandma, patriarch of the family. So my great grandmother was the wife of a minister. So my great grandfather was there in this evening as well. And he was, he was a minister and for like 30 some odd years, they traveled all over the United States preaching the gospel, big tent revivals. I mean, if if there was music playing in the house, it was gospel. She knew how to play the piano, all gospel songs. If the TV was on, it was an evangelist. She like lived, breathed, you know, dreamed. Every waking moment of her life was consumed with Jesus. And she was a, as much of a believer as you can possibly imagine a person is capable of being. And she even had a personal testimony herself that when she was younger, not too much younger, that she almost died of a heart attack. She had a stroke and it almost killed her. And when she was in the hospital, she said Jesus physically walked into her hospital room and smiled at her. Uh, she was paralyzed on the whole left side of her body. They didn't know if she would ever talk again, much less walk. But Jesus smiled at her, turned around and walked out. And she was instantly healed. So when the doctors came back into her room, she's all sitting up, ready to go, talking, moving around, everything perfectly normal. And they're like, what happened? She said, Jesus came in and healed me. Uh, and so she was very open and uh, vocal about it. Uh, like making sure everybody knew about, hey, this is a fantastic miracle that God did for her. And she was so f grateful about this. So this I, I understood and I believed her. I, grandma wouldn't lie. And of course, you'd be kind of hard to lie about, you know, having a stroke and then getting healed like the next day. Uh, so it, she, this was the kind of person she was. She also had a, an angelic encounter story where an angel saved her life physically, uh, rolled her over in the bed. She was dying from carbon monoxide poisoning. And uh, 
a person dressed in a military uniform wearing a pickle hob helmet, so a military type uniform, so strange, was very specific in her description, said this person came in and grabbed her and rolled her over and she could instantly start breathing again. And then he walked right through the door that was bolt locked. So somehow he just opened the door and shut it and walked out. And um, so she has these testimonies and these are the kind of testimonies you could expect from a person uh, who, you know, lived off the side of the road, eating potatoes and stuff during the Great Depression while her parents were taking her all over the place, to, you know, or why, while she was going all over the place doing these big tent revivals and stuff. And, you know, that was their life. Um, but on this evening, she said, I have an announcement. And she started to read this article that sounded exactly like the scene in the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, where the movie starts out, you have the police chase with a with the car, uh, the, the cop car chasing the UFO all over the countryside. Apparently, something exactly like that happened in Madeira back in 1975. And she read this article, and people were just kind of like looking kind of strange, like, why is grandma reading an article about a UFO? And um, when she finished reading the article, she dropped the newspaper and she said, when I was a little girl, I saw a UFO. And then she proceeded to tell everybody in the family what happened, that her and her sister, it was back in like 1910, you know, 100 years ago, um, that they were walking along plains of Kentucky. Neither of them had never even seen an automobile before. They lived like out in the sticks, completely not in town or anything. So they were completely away from civilization. They had a wagon um, that they, you know, that they used. So they'd never seen a vehicle before. They had no frame of reference for what they saw, but they saw this cigar shaped UFO. She said it had no seams on it whatsoever. Perfectly seamless. This beautiful aluminum, polished aluminum looking cigar shaped thing about 30 feet long with a bubble on top hmm. and they even saw the occupant. It was only like maybe 30 feet away or so and just flying along uh, above the ground, like maybe 20, 30 feet. And they were close enough to even see the guy inside turn and look at him as he flew by. And then they went over some bluffs. Uh, he went over some bluffs and just shot up in the sky and disappeared in like a second in the blink of an eye. And her and her sister were like, what was that? They, they were freaking out. And so they ran home, and they both told their mother about it. Well, she was like, don't ever mention this to me ever again. Don't ever tell anybody that, about this story. This is the last I want to hear of this weird stuff. This is, has no place in our family, period. Done. Hmm. So her and her sister had this thing to share, but only between each other. And they didn't disobey their mother. They, they did what she said. Uh, her sister died a couple years later. So, and this was even the first time I heard about that I had, that my great grandmother had a sister. I didn't even know that until she told this testimony. But so her sister died when she was a teenager. And so my grandmother had this all to herself for 60, 70 years. And did she happen to be reading the newspaper and saw this article and read it? And she's like, wait, I know what that is. And it like flipped the switch and she remembered it all came back. And so she said, you know what? I don't care what people think. Those things are real. And so I'm only five years old when I hear this story. On the way home, I'm like plugging my mom with all these questions. What's this? What's this? You know, what, what's a UFO? What are aliens? You know, all this. Well, we were avid Star Trek fan. Uh, you know, people. So mom said, well, you know that show we watched, Star Trek? It's probably a little more real than most people think. And so in my young mind, I was just thinking like grandma, you know, okay, Christianity, Jesus, the Bible, that's real. ETs, that's real. And so I kind of grew up that way, but uh, I really went off on this new age tangent and I got all into paranormal stuff um, as I grew up. And um, so the Christian part of my life didn't really come to life until I was 21. And then I had an encounter with Jesus myself. 
Uh, it was the darkest time in my life. Uh, I was into all kind of things. I was addicted to everything under the sun and um, spiraling downhill. And uh, it, one night I had a dream. Jesus came to me in this dream. He was invisible in the dream, and, and he was a series of things where he was showing me stuff in a symbolic way of what was going on in my life. And basically, the end result is if I don't stop doing what I'm doing, I'm either going to end up dead or in jail. But probably dead, because the dream was pretty graphic. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> so I woke up from the dream, and I, the the feeling of peace that I had in part of the dream, where he he pulled me out of this really horrible place, and I was in this really beautiful, peaceful place, and I felt just so free, and like none of the problems in my life were were bothering me. You know, I, I was like. It was like all this stuff that was on me that I wasn't aware of was just removed. And I got a small taste of that freedom. And then, then it was put back on me. And then I woke up. And then I, I, as I was recalling the dream, I remember sitting in the bed and I vocalized the question out loud. And I wasn't expecting an answer or anything like that. I just like, I remember getting to the part in the dream where the person that was with me showing me all these things, he was invisible. But I could literally see an indentation in the chair. I could see things that he was moving, but he was invisible. And that struck me as like being really weird. Like to dream about somebody that you're seeing that's with you, but he is not letting you see what he looks like. He's making himself invisible. So I, I thought that's weird. And when I got to that part in the dream and I'm remembering it, I said, who was that invisible person? When I asked the question, I heard an answer audibly in my ear, like the whiskers were touching my ear. And the name Jesus entered my ear. And with that name, everything changed in me overnight. I, I just felt his energy just flush through my body. I felt this immense love, just pure saturated love. So, uh, Dawn, you mentioned like with your near-death experience, you said you felt this incredible peace. Um, it was that, that was that level of peace that I felt, but it, it was just so far beyond just peace. It was love, just the pure essence of love washed through me. So I knew that he was real beyond a shadow of a doubt. And if you would have asked me before this incident, were you a Christian? I would have said, yeah, but did I know what even something as fundamental as the Trinity was? Uh, no, I, I didn't know all these things. I, I believe kind of evolution, probably. Uh, I was all new agey and, you know, I, I literally experimented with astral projection and channeling and, and reading runes and tarot cards and palmistry and you name it. Uh, I, I knew a lot of these things. I knew how to do these things. Um, and I was into all of this stuff, and UFOs and stuff were on my plate as a, as a huge thing that I knew a lot about. Uh, I knew about Zechariah Sitchin and, and Von Donikin. Um, <clears throat> but then when this happened, then I was like, okay, the Bible is real. I have to start reading the Bible. And so I made this checklist of things, you know, okay, I think Christians, they, they go to church, so I got to find a church. I got to pray every day. I got to start reading the Bible. I got to, you know, I, I don't know. I was manic, you know, trying to figure out how, how God, God actually came to me. You know, I have to change. Um, how, all, all my friends thought I was nuts, you know. <laughs> it was kind of funny. Um, but anyway, I started reading the Bible, and that's when I, it, Genesis chapter 6, you know, very first book, like second page. I'm reading this. And I was like Fox Mulder, right? I, I had this encyclopedia. I had a literal encyclopedia of the paranormal, too, when I was a kid that I pretty much memorized. But I had this all this information in my head, and I'm reading Genesis 6, and I'm like, I know what this is talking about. This is, th these angels and, you know, that all the Von Donneken stuff, I'm like, yes, that's true. And so... Before I realized it, I started writing notes and stuff, and I'm taking all these notes, and I'm writing these things down. And that became my first book, which I wrote in like three days, uh, Aliens in the Bible. 
Uh, and that was my first rendition of this work. But what this turned into is kind of like picking up my great grandmother's mantle. So my great grandmother, she never felt like the need to reconcile Christianity with um, with the Bible um, or, or Christianity with with the existence of ET. She just believed, okay, they're both real. Uh, me, on the other hand, I ended up seeing a lot of things that are the fruit of this ancient astronaut theory that actually con contradict the Bible. Uh, for example, a race of ETs created humanity. That's common, uh, and I believe that's both Sitchin and Von Donikin believe that. So they're basically saying Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 is wrong. Throw that out. God didn't create humanity. The God who created time, space, the universe, and everything in it is not the God who created humanity <clears throat> as it specifically says in the Bible. So they're redefining God which is very fundamental. So I picked up on these things pretty soon, and my first book, Aliens of the Bible, was kind of like, yes, there's something real going on here, but I think the majority of this is demonic because it's leading people away from Jesus. It's leading people to pick and choose things in the Bible that they say, okay, this is true, but this is how you understand it, and let's just take God and remove him out of the picture. Um, and then... I kept doing research and I kept getting more information from other people and I'm like, wait a minute, I might have thrown the bath, baby out with the bath water, it's not all demonic and that's a typical response from a lot of Christians to just like put this demonic label on a lot of things and I, I'm, I'm really averse to doing that. I am an open-minded Christian, I want to evaluate all sides of it and just because I can't understand something or explain something doesn't mean it's automatically demonic. Um, I've encountered John, that. Can I interrupt you there for one second? And I apologize for that, but it's something that yeah, you said. Yeah. You, you, you say that the whole alien thing is trying to push its way away from God. Am I corrected that you're saying that? Yes. That is it is, well, no, it's trying to redefine God so that is, you think that you're getting closer to God, but, but you're not. Okay. But can you actually, I mean, in my belief, I'm a very spiritual person. I believe in God, but I also believe in uh, in ufology, in, in ETs. It doesn't take my uh, spiritual beliefs away from it. it. Doesn't I mean, because like I said earlier in the show, I know demons are walking this earth and stuff. And I don't care what anybody says. I know in my heart there is God, there's evil, and there's good. I've seen it all. But I, I think a lot of ufologists... Uh, kind of believe that yes, there is a God, but maybe God, because we don't know, maybe God made other civilizations on other planets, and I believe before that before us or after us. Yeah, to what be fair, Chris, this, Chris, hold on. To yeah. be fair, John, I thought you were getting ready to say that you came back, you stepped back, or you broadened your understanding. Yes, that it's not all demonic. That you were. You, were, you had made a rash judgment like we often do when we look at something. You know, you look yes. at it, you made a conclusion, but now you, you didn't think that. So, Chris, I, I don't think you caught that. Yeah, I, I'm just curious because you wrote a book yeah, yeah. called Aliens and the Antichrist. And I'm really yes. fascinated how you how you actually came about putting aliens with the Antichrist. And that kind of like said, oh, I got to ask him that question because that's yeah. an interesting topic. And another one of my books is called The Strong Delusion. And it's referring to a strong delusion that's going to come over the overshadow the planet in the end times. And it's something that's always plagued me. Like, how could people be lied to in such a way that people from religions all over the world just suddenly abandon their religion and believe in this new thing? Um, and then people from, you know, agnostics and atheists will believe in it, too. Something so powerfully deceptive that it gets people from all walks of life, all religions, all cultures across the planet. And this alien thing would be something that would do just that. If they had some kind of new agey explanation as to how God could be an alien instead of the creator, um, that, you know, let's say, oh, they misunderstood who Jesus was. He's actually an ET from this other planet out here, and they're really powerful and really advanced. They have really long longevity. And that Jesus will actually return to Earth in the future and say, oh, you, you got it all wrong. I didn't create the whole universe and everything in it. You know, I, I am a son of God. So they'll take the same language 
you know, I'm a king from another world, which might literally be true, but this will not be the same Jesus that is the real Jesus. Um, the Bible talks about a false prophet that's coming in the future who will be incredibly deceptive, and he will be the one supporting this Antichrist character who's going to be in charge of this, this deception that's coming. So I really started digging into it, and it, the more I researched these ETs, the more I saw eschatology in times is all over it. Jesus literally said, when I return, one of the signs of my return is it will be like the days of Noah. So out of all of history, he singles out the days of Noah to say the world is going to be like that again. And what's different? The difference there is you had angelic beings from other worlds coming to earth and interfacing in human society and people were basically worshiping them that same deception is coming again we are going to essentially abandon whatever the bible teaches about god and about jesus and believe whatever these beings tell us yep. so that's what i'm trying to warn people about and i respect i respect your thought on that john but the agenda, or I should say the narrative, is calling them a threat. They're not. Yes, I mean, they're not all bad, the though. The National Security State, the Air Force, well, the Air Force hasn't said anything. By the way, thank you for your service. But the Air Force yeah. hasn't said anything. But the Navy and some of the others are actually Army. painting a narrative that they're, they're bad. Right. Rather than saying they're obviously oh, they're, not they're, all they're bad, bad, or we wouldn't even be here anymore. So there is. There are factions in the heavens, and the Bible even explains this. John, uh, I wrote I wrote a paper that uh, <clears throat> was released not long ago. I wrote it actually <clears throat> months and months ago about disclosure. I'm sure you're all over the concept of disclosure. Yep. Disclosure, I maintain, and I, I've been in this business a very long time. I was the director of research for UFO Magazine, which my wife and I published here in L.A. for over 20 years. And disclosure is one of those, I believe, pipe dreams that will never happen for a couple of reasons. Number one, going at least as far back as 47, okay, with the Roswell event, whatever that event was, that the powers that be at that time discovered something that truly terrified them. And <clears throat> as a result, they became extremely concerned that whatever that secret was, if it hit the public, it would be bad for all of humanity, not just we people in America, but around the world. So as a result, Ultimately, they surrounded that secret with a special access program. Now, we've got an SAP. <clears throat> now, we've got enough circumstantial evidence to suggest that is absolutely correct. <clears throat> and basically, my paper says that in my research for over 30 years, all right, I have come to the conclusion that if we are being visited by even one group, there are numerous groups. I've, I've joked and said I think that planet Earth is right off the freeway from the Intergalactic Express. A lot of, a lot of, of you know, different types of, of beings have been witnessed and different types of craft. So the bottom line is, not all of those beings get nope. along with each other. No, nope, they don't. And not all of them are bad. No, so, I'm not saying I'm yeah. not saying that. Yeah. What I am saying is that there is conflict even now going on out there. <clears throat> and I think one of the reasons they're trying to keep this quiet, they do not want that known. Now, in my research, and I'll, I'll cut this off real soon. <clears throat> There are at least six, seven groups of different ETs that have come here. Possibly many more, but at least six or seven groups. Several of those groups are very kindly disposed to humanity. 
a couple of groups are benign. They basically don't care one way or the other. They're here for academic reasons. But there is one group that is inimical toward humanity. For whatever reason, they don't like us. And this is the group, I think, that is instigated, that has instigated conflict. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, like as I was mentioning, uh, the Bible even talks about this, this structure. It mentions three heavens. It describes Earth as a multi-dimensional construct. Um, that, that the sky isn't just like sky with clouds, you know. Uh, there is a place called First Heaven um, in another dimension. So taking quantum theory in, into, uh, you know, applying quantum theory, we actually have multiple layers of existence here on Earth. In First Heaven, this, where we're at right now, we're inside of the Earth. We're like, the, the Earth is an onion of lithospheres with hell in the heart of the earth. It's a smaller planet, basically. Uh, there's not an entire civilization wallowing around in magma. They're on a smaller planet in, in a lower dimension. In a higher dimension, you, you have first heaven, and it's a civilization just like this one's physical world, uh, but there's angelic beings that rule in different areas. And Lucifer is the prince of the power of the air. He has the majority of the power over the whole planet. But there's some areas where there's contention. So it's just like look at politics in the world today. You have wars, wars that are fought and whatnot, different different regions where there's different authorities. And in the book of Deuteronomy, I don't have the exact reference, but it says that God divided the regions of the earth a portion to the watchers, the Benai Elohim, the sons of God. So they're ruling in certain areas. Michael, according to Jewish literature, is over Israel. He's the reason why that little tiny chunk of land still exists, surrounded by enemies that want to wipe them out. Um, so you could kind of get an idea of who's in charge of the country and the, high, and the heavens by looking at what goes on in that country. A country where there's lots of just wholesale slaughter going on, you, you know, that's a fallen angel that's over that particular area. Uh, areas where there's more freedom, where there's more... Um, <clears throat> Not, not as much chaos and death and destruction and killing or war or whatever. Those areas, probably uh, it's a, an angel that's in charge of that area. Uh, but in the book of Daniel, you see uh, Daniel starts praying and the archangel Gabriel comes to give him a message, but the prince of Persia hinders him. So if you can imagine Earth, he's traveling from outer space, the word Shamim, the heavens, same as outer space so he's traveling from the glorified realms of the heavens trying to come to earth and as soon as he comes he hits he's he's countered by this angelic demonic or or satanic force uh headed up by this fallen angel known as the prince of persia who hinders him 21 days but he finally gets past him when michael sends forces to fight and help him to get through he delivers his message to daniel then he has to leave and he says he has to encounter this dude again to get out. So that kind of gives you this encapsulation of the first heaven realm where there's angelic beings that are there. That said, they could even have bases and stuff and spaceships and, and everything else in the first heaven on this planet. Uh, but I also believe that they're all across the cosmos. So uh, Revelation 12, 6 talks about, 6 and 7 talks about the dragon dragged a third of the stars from the sky and threw them to the earth. This is going to happen in the end times. Uh, Daniel chapter 8 talks about heavenly forces doing battle with each other in the end times. And it's going to be involving us, and the Antichrist is going to be involved in this as well. So we're actually looking at battles in the future where you're going to have different nations aligned with otherworldly factions and these battles that are among us here down on earth are actually going to extend into the heavenly realm probably even spanning beyond this dimension but we may even be seeing ships and stuff fighting in the sky all kind of crazy stuff going on um but the you know there's checks and balances right now so the enemy totally has enough power to obliterate this planet 
uh, if he wanted to, but he can't because God is preventing him. And also, his, his strategy isn't just to destroy humanity. Uh, he could have just blown up the planet, right, if that were the case. You know, if God let him, he just would blow us up. But uh, he won't let him because it's about our choice. So you go back to humanity and free will, and what's the whole point of God allowing Satan to do all this stuff to begin with? It's, it's our choice. It's to allow us to choose between him or what the enemy has to offer. And that is a, a delicate balance. And you, you see these skirmishes, like these, these abductions that happen in the middle of the night. Why, why do they sneak around like that? It's because they're like going under the wire. They're not supposed to do that. So then when they get abducted and somebody says, in the name of Jesus, I cast you out, they freak out. They deposit the human back down on the earth and they bug out because they know that angels are going to come and, and get them, apprehend them, and imprison them. So they seriously don't want that. So they act like demons, these that are doing this illegal stuff. But on the flip side, there's, there's a glory side to this too because God's good guys are in the picture also. You see them in Ezekiel chapter 1 and Ezekiel chapter 10. Those were God's glorified angels there. Those were God's glorified angels appearing to Daniel, giving him his message. Every instance in the Bible of a, a glorified angel talking to a person, there's most likely UFOs going on. Second Kings, where you see this, this chariot. Angelic chariot does not look like a chariot. They use that word chariot in a generic sense, angelic vehicle. So the Bible literally says angels use vehicles. So you get all of this stuff. This is where Zachariah Sitchin and, and Von Donneken are correct. You can read all of these things in the Bible and you say, yes, these are, these are God's manifestations here, but they're angels. They're not God. They, they take it a step further and they say, okay, this is God. But I'm like, wait a minute. It's not God. God delegates a lot of things to angels, like that giant column that floated over Israel, that split the Red Sea, that fed the Israelites in the desert for 40 years. That was probably a UFO. Angels were doing all of that, but God was there. He'd probably bop in and out whenever, because God's a very personal being. I mean, that's why he became a human being. Well, like John, a I want to ask you a, a question, if I may. Yeah, Just, yeah. And, and I respect everything you're saying. Um, you, you mentioned interdimensional, as you talked about hell and everything else at different dimensions, correct? Yes. So the flavor of the month, as far as ufology goes, has been the word interdimensional. It started with David Grush. Everybody was thinking off-world aliens, extraterrestrials. Then David Grush comes by and he starts using the word interdimensional. Then a congresswoman comes out and says, we just had a briefing and they never said anything about aliens. They said interdimensional. That was a quote right from a congresswoman after a, a closed door briefing. So you're kind of aligning to that. Am I correct on that? Yes. And the second question I wanted to ask you is, because you were a command sergeant, sergeant, right? Master sergeant? Chief master sergeant. You probably had a top secret clearance because you worked yeah. in cybersecurity. You probably worked at the Pentagon, correct? Uh, no, I did not. I've been to NSA. Oh. Yeah. All right. Well, there you go. So... Lou Alessandro says that he was stopped by people in the Pentagon, in the military, and were told that, hey, we know what this UFO thing is all about. It's all about demonic entities and uh, heaven and hell and everything. So in your career, you're, you're in, in, you've had a, a tremendous career by what I've read about you. Um, did you hear that from the Pentagon, from reputable sources, or was that not there? I heard things through unofficial channels, and I also heard something at a chief's conference that I thought was really interesting because somebody accidentally said something he shouldn't have said. Well, what and do you say? Was, this was in my like last year of being in. Uh, I was at a chief's conference where you know they had chiefs from the Air Force and Air National Guard all converged. You know, so a lot of them all over the United States were there, and it was a question and question and answer session and somebody said something about you know are you going to brief us on on the mission to Antarctica and immediately it was like 
You didn't say that. Shut your mouth. Not another word. Another discussion, another day, different setting. Done. Uh, it was just so, the way he snapped at the guy, and it was just so quick and so like, damn, that's secret. Because most of us then in there had top secret clearance. And the way he treated that guy, I was like, okay, I know a few things about Antarctica from, you know, reading about uh, Admiral Byrd and uh, Steve Quayle's research and the, the Nazis supposedly setting up something there and doing all this otherworldly stuff. And apparently we, we sent an entire fleet there and, and they had to turn around because they were under attack and by these ships coming out of the water, uh, spaceships. So I heard all of this stuff. I also heard about um, radar imagery, or not radar, uh, satellite imaging that has seen a lot of heat under the ice on the west coast of Antarctica. And so they know that something is generating a lot of heat there. The unofficial story is, oh, it's tectonic activity. And that's why they, you see these big chunks of ice melting and falling that they, they showed in the uh, Al Gore video. Um, <clears throat> so it had to do with tectonic stuff underneath the ice, not, you know, a hole in the ozone. The polar so, bears. Oh, my God. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I've been hearing more and more about Antarctica. And then I uh, recently heard uh, from a researcher, Linda Howe, uh, that uh, was talking about some Navy SEAL whistle whistleblowers that found that were reporting about these gigantic facilities or giant rooms. They're like nine acres each. Uh, the walls and the ceiling, the walls are 40 feet high, the ceiling, and they're made of this um, volcanic material with a strange kind of hieroglyphics in it. They're a combination of like uh, Sumerian and Egyptian. Uh, they don't understand how these rooms, they said that, they, that the walls are made, that this material is somehow impregnated with um, software code at the molecular level, because when you walk near the wall or you're under the particular part of the ceiling, it illuminates with light. And that there's no support structures and it's only four inches thick. So it's a kind of a, it's got some kind of force field that it's emanating. And we don't have the technology to decipher how it's doing what it's doing. So this is from an, uh, apparently these two Navy SEALs and then a, um, an archaeologist that was talking to both of them and it was two separate accounts so they both gave nearly identical stories but they didn't even know each other uh, they went there on an extraction uh, to get somebody and take them out of there so this I heard on her show but I actually heard about something in Antarctica that's incredibly classified uh, that's going on uh, over there in Antarctica uh, now I wasn't briefed on any details or anything like that but through my official channels, I knew about that uh, because of that mention. Um, and then unofficially, I knew somebody who worked at NORAD that said he saw things on, uh, on the radar and in, in the upper outer atmosphere. He saw um, a V formation of school bus sized objects flying thousands of miles an hour. Uh, this is back in the 80s. Uh, so this is long before we had any technology like that. Um, and uh, well, wait a minute, no, John. Yeah. I, I, I gotta grab you there. We were flying Mach 6 capable vehicles in the 60s, so in outer space, uh, no, not in outer space, but yeah, these were in outer space, and it was a V formation of several of them. But the but you had hypersonic vehicles that did enter outer space in World War II. So, before we when you make a statement like that, I gotta kind of grab it to okay. put it in context. I mean, they could have been ours for all I know. I'm just telling you what I heard that, you know, well, I'm, I'm always in the public knowledge. We're not supposed up. to spend three seasons in it and in Africa, uh, not the entire uh, continent. Unfortunately, I did get a chance to go all the way around the continent. Uh, uh -huh. And I, I, I've, I've seen and heard a lot about it. Unfortunately, none of this has ever, I never saw the evidence of it, but I, I always find it interesting I think there's more going on there than we will uh, ever yeah. confess to. And I didn't hear enough to connect the dots between uh, the top secret stuff I heard about is the same stuff that Linda Howe's talking about. I don't know. 
I, I know that there's scientists there. That's pretty much all the people that are, are there. And obviously there's going to be some technology that's going to be top secret. So, I mean, there's that as far as a disclaimer. I just think that uh, I do believe in our future that as part of the strong delusion deception, we're going to find highly advanced otherworldly technology and that will feed into it. Uh, but the thing is, uh, the, the whole reason I wrote this book is because I saw that, that disclosure from the Navy in 2020, and I'm like, hearing about these people from the Pentagon freaking out, Christians from the Pentagon freaking out, and I'm like, you know what, you can believe in this, and you can understand this, and there really can be advanced technology buried in the earth and still believe in the Bible. You don't have to ditch being a Christian just because you're being confronted with these things that you're, you can't reconcile it. Because the Bible actually says that Satan, when he was Lucifer, once ruled as a king, and he was in charge of it as a king. He had an entire civilization, a kingdom. And it says in, in uh, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28, there's just mark those down and read them and, and meditate on those. Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. It talks about a time when Lucifer was a king and walked in the Garden of Eden. That has to predate Adam and Eve. You, you can't have Adam and Eve being given dominion over the earth and then yeah. this other king over here at the same time. So that kingdom, and that was when Lucifer, when, before he sinned. So that's a long time ago. And the whole six days of all creation, it, uh, no, I, I'm an old earth theorist. That's another thing that I changed. When I wrote Aliens the Bible, I believe that uh, 6,000 years is roughly the age of the earth and that God created all things. Now I understand it completely different, and part of that comes from studying the Hebrew. Uh, Genesis 1.1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Done. They're made. They're done. And then he populated everything. You know, God entered into time space in the person of Jesus. He populated the cosmos with life. And then it was like that for millions, maybe billions of years. And angels lived in peace and harmony. And Satan actually was Lucifer and had a kingdom here on this planet and probably spanned the cosmos, probably had his civilization went to Mars, probably Saturn, and another planet that I think used to be in the asteroid belt but blew up. And that's called the exploded planet hypothesis, and I mentioned that in my book, but it talks about in the Bible how Rahab, a fire came up from in the center of Rahab and most people interpret Rahab to be synonymous with what happened to Egypt, but I think it has an earlier precedent with a planet that Satan had like a stronghold there. And when Michael came to overthrow Satan or Lucifer, he blew up his planet and a chunk of that planet hit Earth and a chunk of it hit Mars, wiped out Mars, whatever was there, and that could be an explanation for the explosion evidence that we're talking about. A chunk of it also hit Saturn and flipped Saturn 90 degrees perpendicular because the rings of Saturn spin perpendicular to its orbit, which is just weird. And people have theorized, astrophysicists theorized about it, saying it's something obviously hit it and spit it. So there's evidence of this cosmic explosion that happened in this, unit, in this, uh, in this solar system sure. a long time ago. From what I'm hearing from you, John, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. One, we are looking, we're moving away from God, and this is Satan's way of using alien and, and, and alien uh, extraterrestrials to move us away from God. Am I correct on, on that? Yes. Okay. And then the other thing you're saying is that, from what I'm gathering, you're you're partially saying that we're almost in Revelations, or we're in Revelations now. Oh, we are. Is, we are. Okay. Yes. So, I mean, if, artificial intelligence, Revelation chapter thirteen. I mean, it's it's all over. I, there's like a dozen prophecies. Israel becoming a nation again after two thousand years of nothing. Uh, there's a lot of prophecies that are just lining up, and the days of Noah. What we're seeing with all the UF, UAP disclosure and everything, that's returning to the days of Noah. It's another sign. Okay. Uh, the, the one question I have for you is that 
if if this revelations is happening and we're seeing this now ufology is a, a theme that move us away from god not all of it okay not all of it but part of it why won't they give us disclosure then why doesn't anybody come out and say folks this is what's happening because what what you're saying is is the good people should be standing up saying I don't care what these people say. We need to tell the human race right now what's going on. Right, John? So, I mean, yeah. you take that. Satan is the reason. Uh, I would say probably the biggest reason why but Satan doesn't being have held control. Of, I mean, Satan has powers and he can do this, but we still have free will. God has given us free will, right? Uh, yes. So okay, let me so put it to you this way. Will, if the ETs wanted to show up, we don't have the technology up. or capability to stop them. Correct. So they are not doing this. And we are. It's, it, it's because, well, I mean, they could put an end to our not wanting to disclose them just by showing up. They could. They could just, you know. But why aren't the good guys coming out and saying, the story of what we want to hear, disclosure, the truth. Whether disclosure is demonic, uh, revelations, extraterrestrial, interdimensional, whatever it is, there's people holding on to this. And it doesn't matter. There's a technology, matter, piece. We've, there's a technology we've got, piece, too. We've got the national security state up and running full steam, okay, which means what? If somebody goes against the powers that be, voila, they're gone. Yep. They had a heart attack. They had a brain aneurysm. They committed Maybe they suicide. had a commit, committed suicide with six rounds of nine millimeter in the back of their head. You know, that's yeah. why. Yeah. So uh, may I ask have you people keeping it a secret up until 2020. So something is definitely changing. Hold on one second. Martin, please. Yes, uh, John, I'd like to ask you. I know you were in the back in the studio, in the green room, as they call it, um, while we had our first hour of the show. And I wondered what you thought about some of the topics. Any of them uh, you want to touch on? Well, I really uh, like and appreciate the near-death experience uh, testimony there. And, um, you know, um, in, in relation to the multidimensional aspect of reality that you mentioned, um, uh, when it comes to ETs, yes, they come from other worlds. Yes, they come from other dimensions because the entire the entire universe is multidimensional. Each planet is a multidimensional construct. Our entire our physical bodies are multidimensional constructs. We have a a non physical spirit integrated with a physical body. Um, in the future, the Bible even says our body is going to be translated and then will become like the angels. Uh, Luke twenty thirty six says that. So we're going to be made whole when we're fixed in the future. And, uh, but the universe itself is fractured and it's, it's both, it's split up into a bunch of dimensions and it's also the universe. So it's both interdimensional. And, uh, you know, so that I'd say is one of the things that kind of sticks out to me that the whole out of body experience and stuff. Um, and then how that ties back to the whole, you know, ETs and stuff, because um, the Bible, it's just really interesting because the Bible tells you so much about so many different things. Um, my first book, Aliens in the Bible, talks about ETs, but I also talk about ghosts and astral projection and uh, all of the paranormal things that I was into before. Um, but I actually research it and show like, OK, well, here's what the Bible says about these things and how you can understand a context from a Christian point of view without necessarily just saying, oh, it's all demonic and refusing to look at anything. Um, and it, it kind of opens up a, a can of worms with just so many topics, like the, the whole thing that you mentioned about Genesis chapter 6. Um, there's a lot more detail of that in the book of Enoch um, and in, also in the uh, book of Jasher about these Nephilim. Um, Here's an interesting tidbit. Uh, these Nephilim, 
uh, were hybrid human and, and angel, but they didn't stop with just humans. They they messed around with all kinds of things. According to Greek legends, among others, uh, these beings were so powerful they could shape shift, and so. I think they shape-shifted and turned into animals and mated with animals, too. And so that you had two different kinds of Nephilim. You had human-angel hybrid, but you, and then some of them were giants, as the Bible talks about, and they were the most formidable. But you also had these human-animal hybrids, so you see those also throughout all these different mythologies and stuff. I mean, Set, the Egyptian god, the you know, dog head, uh, Baal, who was a... Um, bull's head and man's body, uh, centaurs, mentars, all these different things. Uh, so that's that's an interesting tidbit because you have all of this whole range of, of cryptids uh, that spawn from those, those Nephilim. Well, you know, speaking about the Book of Enoch, that is one of the forbidden books of the Bible, so-called forbidden book. Now, the Council of Nicaea, Okay, there was there was a time, John, when I considered, when I was in my teens, entering the ministry. So I I read and reread the Bible, okay, quite a bit. I had a lot of questions for, it, but but the history probably I loved the most. But during the Council of Nicaea, okay, the Emperor Constantine saw, and this is my take on it, Christianity as a controlling mechanism for the great unwashed masses. And many of those books were arbitrarily kicked out because they didn't adhere to the overarching, basically, message that the powers that be at that time wanted to project. What What is your take on those forbidden books of the Bible? Yeah, so the Book of Enoch, lost the vote by one vote, I read. Now, I didn't go and research and confirm that, but it was almost included, and it is actually referenced in the book of Jude. So it's right there, and in the Ethiopian Bible, it actually still is. I mean, they said, you know, Council of Nicaea, never mind. We're yeah, still we're including playing, that book. We're not playing by that de decision. <laughs> Yeah, and I, I think they really missed out on that. And basically, the, the whole part about angels mating with humans, it's sort of, they were like, ah, we don't know how to deal with that. Um, and they they took a hard right from the early church because the early church, um, they did believe that angels did cross with humans, that they were physical beings. Um, and I, I really delved into this more, more from a scientific perspective because here I'm like reading the Bible you know, with, with all this science in my head and, and new agey type stuff, but more of an analytical scientific frame of mind when I read it for the first time. And I'm wondering why would an angel be even attracted to a human? It's not like I'm looking at a, at a fence post and then suddenly getting aroused. I mean, if there is no anatomy for that, if it's not built into me, it just wouldn't be there. So how are they aroused? So I started asking these questions. I couldn't get a suitable answer from any Christians that I talked to. And I, I finally came, to, I had an epiphany. If, if Adam and Eve were created as pseudo-immortal when they were first created, they had to eat from the tree in order to stay alive. And then they had sex, but they were not angels. Jesus said, after we get translated, we will be like the angels, which neither marry or they are not given in marriage. So they'll be a, this new higher form Translation, therefore, is a type of metamorphosis that humans are designed, were originally designed to go through. So if Adam and Eve never sinned, they would have become like angels and then not reproduced well, anymore. And that's where angels came from. We're rapidly coming up to the end of it. So I want to, I want to first thank you, thank all my hosts as we roar up to the top of the show. Uh, very interesting show, a lot of interesting parts. There was a, a question that came up. Did Paul... Uh, see an alien, and if he did, what does that mean for Christianity? Why you think of the answer on that? Um, I want to thank everybody for participating uh, in the audience as well. I know that it uh, it throws a lot off, but I think John, the conclusion you have is one of the conclusions I came to that all of this is interconnected. That all the activity of what we're talking about, 
and I will always say that man created the Bible inspired by God, no doubt in my mind. Um, but it is a book of faith. It, just because it is a book of faith doesn't mean it, it doesn't have evidentiary pieces on there. And I think that Don would understand where I'm, I'm coming on this because we've talked about this in the past as well. So I'd like to leave you the last couple of minutes before we drop out of the show. And uh, while you'll be, we'll be, you and I will be talking and we'll be getting ready for a show dedicated just to this, uh, this topic in your work. But thank you all. And I wish everyone uh, a great part. John, take us on. Okay. Uh, first of all, my website it, is my name, johnmyler.com. Uh, and uh, anybody that has questions that they can email me and I'll answer personally, J-M-I-L-O-R at yahoo.com. And you guys, if any of you guys email me, I'll, I'll email you my books. And then you, you have for free. You could uh, read them at your leisure. Uh, regarding the question, uh, did Paul see an alien? Um, probably. Um, so what is an alien? Uh, I, I talk about that. I believe that aliens and, ex, you know, aliens and angels are the same thing. There are faithful angels and there are fallen angels. Uh, so there's good aliens and there's bad aliens. But there's also beings that are in the heavens that were like Adam and Eve, that they didn't sin, but they're still mortal and they're still reproducing. And they became really advanced societies, and they're able to travel here. Um, there's probably also aliens that were like us in the same boat as us, and they sinned. They, you know, the, the tail, the dragon dragged a third of the stars from the sky, deceived countless minions out there. If they were like Adam and Eve, they would have been become mortal like us, but possibly very advanced nonetheless. They might actually be coming here to find out about Jesus. So, the, you know, you won't hear that from any ancient aliens show, but uh, I think it's a very distinct possibility that angels could be coming here to find out, like, what's up with Earth? You know, we hear that God actually, you know, the creator of the universe, because he's no mystery to the glorified beings that are out there. They actually go to his planet, which is in the northern hemisphere. The Bible refers to it in three different places. It's a physical location in the universe. That's where God has his capital throne. And the angels know about this, but they don't want to let anybody know. You know, the fallen ones don't want us to know these things. Instead, they're going to spin this whole other theology about it and deviate from the Bible and get you so much truth that part of you is going to say, oh, I know, I know that there's got to be truth to this. I could feel it because John, most of the lie will be true. We're, we're at the end of, uh, of the show. I thank you. And it's been a, a pleasure to have you. And uh, thank Absolutely. everyone on the show. And see you next week. Happy Easter to all. And those that are celebrating Ramadan, a safe conclusion to Ramadan as well. Happy Easter. Thank you, John. Happy Easter. Thank you, John. Thank Thank you, you. gentlemen.